thank you, John, and thank you for the invitation to uh, address this body. I'm really, uh, uh, I'm not sure if now is everybody's ready to sit back and nod out, but um, uh, anyway. Uh, I hope this works because we had some issues, but uh, we'll see. Um, the vast majority of work on human cooperation has focused on cooperation as altruism. And that uh, is for uh, obvious reasons that it's the, it's the, from an evolutionary point of view, the greatest theoretical challenge to explain why an individual would do something to uh, sacrifice to benefit another individual. <clears throat> but I have come over the years to believe that um, the, um, if we ask a different question, if our goal is to understand what it is that makes humans so different from other primates, how it is that we are here in this very complex building under the aegis of this complex social institution, multiple social institutions, with all of these complex technologies. <clears throat> the answer is not altruism. The answer is collaboration. The answer is cooperation in the sense of uh, collaborative activities for mutual benefit, mutualism. Um, mutualism is not a theoretical challenge in the way that altruism is, but um, it, I believe it is the originating force. Now, of course, you need, uh, of course, partner choice. Uh, I don't need to tell this crowd that, but uh, we'll, I'll elaborate on that um, as we go along. Um, all, in all human societies, mutualistic collaborative activities are uh, ubiquitous, but outside of coalitions for uh, dominance in dominance contests, in other primate societies, they are exceedingly rare. <clears throat> so the one major exception to this is, um, great, uh, is chimpanzee group hunting of monkeys. Now, this uh, really incredibly fascinating behavior has both a more cooperative uh, explanation and uh, a more individualistic one. This diagram comes from Christoph Bosch. He gives the more cooperative explanation. He basically explains it like human collaboration. They have a joint goal to catch the monkey. They each have their own role to do it, and uh, they work toward that together. But the more individualistic interpretation uh, would be something like this. I I've seen three of these myself live, so that uh, comes, I have a little bit of uh, intuitive feel as well as the literature. What happens is this, um, um, so a, a, a small band of uh, uh, male chimpanzees are going along, and they see a red colobus monkey, uh, typically a little bit separated from his group, hopefully down low a little bit, and one individual starts chasing him, okay? And then the monkey starts running, and then another chimp says, whoa, he's going over there, I'll come over here. And then another chimp says, well, okay, there's an escape route he might take, given that these two are blocked, and so I'll go over here. And the other one says, uh, well, you know, all the good places are taken, I think I'll stay on the ground here and hope he falls. Okay, and so the result is they surround him, uh, but each monkey is really, each chimp is really trying to get the monkey for itself. And uh, so it, 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 like wolves, like uh, lions, there is this cooperative outcome, uh, but actually it's being done on the basis of each individual hoping they'll get it themselves. Then at the end, uh, there is, um, uh, the, the, the captor gets the best parts and gets to eat, but everybody else is pulling at it and trying to get some and they're sharing under pressure. So for chimps, this is optional. This is, this is, a, this is not their normal daily, uh, their normal food, uh, and some groups don't do it at all. Um, and uh, surprisingly, perhaps, uh, they don't do it when, food, when the vegetation is short. Uh, they do it when the vegetation is most abundant, uh, presumably because they fail at this quite often, and this is a good backup. So there's not a lot of um, selective pressure for them to do this, because it's optional. It's also, there's no partner choice. Uh, they're not choosing their partners. It's opportunistic, and so uh, there's not a lot of social selection for good cooperators either. Um, there's no uh, uh, planning or coordination, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, there, uh, uh, communication, other than the excited screams that they do for all kinds of uh, abundant foods. Um, and uh, the food sharing is only under pressure. Uh, it goes in the tolerated theft direction. Uh, uh, the, 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 the captor would like to take it all if he could, but he has to um, let everybody else have some or else he's gonna get out of it. And there's no exclusion of free riders. 
So this doesn't look like um, a system that has evolved as an evolutionarily stable strategy. Um, it's something that these clever animals do when they're given the opportunity. Uh, and so what I want to uh, focus on is what I would trying to characterize as the human difference. When humans are collaborating toward a mutual goal, for example, in collaborative foraging, uh, what's the human difference? And the sort of theoretical um, umbrella that I'm using is uh, called shared intentionality theory. It comes from some philosophers of action. And the idea is that chimps are operating with individual intentionality. That is, they have intentions, they pursue goals, uh, they uh, read others' intentions and mental states. Some of you may have seen our uh, paper in the fall in, uh, in science uh, about chimps uh, understanding false beliefs. Uh, there's a lot, I have a whole talk on chimps and how amazing they are, but that's not my talk uh, tonight. Uh, so they're reading others' intentions and mental states, but this is all for competition. Even in the case of the foraging that I just showed you, the group foraging, it's really got a very large competitive component. Everybody wants to be the one that captures the monkey because the one that captures it gets the most and the best parts. In contrast, something happened in human evolution where they began to be able to uh, share intentions for mutual benefit. And uh, they put their heads together to collaborate and do things that no individual could do, and that produces extra benefit. So, um, uh, uh, the, the model, the game theory model, is not the, com the mixed motive games like Prisoner's Dilemmas and so forth. These are coordination games. It's in everybody's uh, uh, interest to collaborate. You get more rewards if you collaborate than if you don't. So um, what you have to do for this is social and mental coordination. I'm saying mental coordination because communication is a big part of it social coordination, mental coordination for mutual benefit. And in that case, you don't want to hide your intentions the way you do when you're competing. You want to advertise your intentions to your collaborative partner because the better he can read them, the better you can collaborate and the more likely you are to succeed. So this, I would say, is a fundamental shift that something happened in evolution that led to this new, uh, more uh, putting your heads together kind of model of collaboration uh, as compared to what the other uh, mammals and um, uh, primates are doing. So the, the more specific evolutionary hypothesis that was in current anthropology a few years ago was um, that there were two steps in human evolution, and I'm not going to go crazy with this part of it because the main part of my talk is empirical, uh, but there were two steps. The first uh, was col it's collaboration, which uh, essentially means between individuals and culture, which is a more uh, group-based thing. Uh, and so joint intentionality, collaboration is, uh, came about somewhere after Homo, before Homo heidelbergensis, uh, somewhere uh, in that little short million and a half year period. Um, something obligate collaborative foraging. Humans had to collaborate to get food, whatever happened. There are various evolutionary fairy tales you can tell about terrestrial monkeys, population explosion, they're taking all the food humans would normally take, whatever it is, I'm, I, I don't uh, know. But cl obli obligate collaborative foraging with partner choice. So this means if you're not a good collaborator, you don't get food. That's all there is to it. So uh, no, if, you're a, if you hog the food, uh, you get excluded from future, um, from future opportunities. I think a big part of this was cooperative breeding. That's not my focus tonight. I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit at the end. But cooperative breeding is part of this whole uh, complex. Um, and the logic of it is the logic of interdependence. Uh, when you become interdependent with individuals, then it is in your interest to invest in those in whom you, on whom you are dependent. And I think this is a, an insight that is not sufficiently appreciated by modelers of cooperation, that there are individuals there that I depend on totally. And so it's in my interest to help them whenever I can. I, I, I give us an example um, in a recent book. Um, if the only female in the group that will mate with me and I approach food at the same time, what is it in my interest, what is it in my um, reproductive interest to do? Well, it's not to take all the food myself. It's to have my mating partner get her fair share uh, so that we both can go along and end up producing more progeny. And the same logic applies to my coalition partner, to my grooming partner, and there's a mathematics to each of them about how much I'm dependent on them and how much it's in my interest to help them. But 
The logic is the same. And of course, you have potentially a free riding problem there, of course, in interdependent situations. But the free riding problem is exactly the same as it is in kin selection. Kin selection, nobody questions kin selection. But in kin selection, yes, I want my brother to be helped, but I just assume somebody else help him first. And if nobody will, well, then I will. But the logic is exactly the same. I'm dependent on somebody for my, um, uh, uh, for my uh, uh, reproductive success, for my um, fitness future fitness. So a second aspect of this approach is that mutualism provides a context for greater altruism. Now, I don't think all of the altruism that you see in humans is due to this, but the extra part that humans do over and above other apes, we have studies, Joan Silk has said, other people have studies about um, chimpanzees helping others. So it, it didn't start with humans, of course. but um, um, when you are collaborating with somebody, if you and I are collaborating uh, in, to, to get food and you're having trouble, well, it's in my interest to sacrifice a little bit to help you do your task better because then we succeed in the end. So mutualistic activity provides an umbrella for an altruistic activity under its, um, uh, in that context. Again, there's a mathematics to this, uh, but um, the, the logic is is uh, clear. So both kin selection and mutualism provide an, a, a context in which altruism uh, can be to my uh, greater benefit. I can sacrifice a bit now in, in the context of that. And then I, I help the guy, and then he's not motivated to uh, defect and cheat after I help him but he because it's in his interest to co come back to the mutualistic activity. So he doesn't have to pay me back. Uh, by helping me back, he just has to do his thing, which is to uh, continue with the mutualistic activity. Cooperation, cooperative communication um, is uh, uh, um, evolved partly to facilitate this kind of uh, coordination, to coordinate our mental states as we're doing this. I'm going to focus on that first, on, on some ontogenetic studies that I think speak to that first hypothesis, that first step there. But I'll mention the second step. Um, the second step is the, um, the focus of our Lifetime Achievement Awards winner here. Uh, culture, collective intentionality, culture as one big collaborative activity is the way I like to think about it. It's scaled up in evolution uh, from a small scale individuals to the whole group collaborating. Competition with other groups leads to things like cultural group selection. Again, the, uh, as our uh, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award uh, winners have studied. Uh, we have th things like collective um, conventions, norms, institutions that help facilitate the cooperation uh, at this larger group level and so forth. But anyway, that's the general evolutionary hypothesis. And what I'm going to focus on um, tonight is the following. If this hypothesis is true, uh, we should expect to see certain proximate mechanisms in humans today. I, that's, uh, that's basically the evolutionary psychology, the basic um, um, uh, premise. Um, and the method that I use is comparative experiments. So we compare apes and humans, and particularly human children, uh, to see what is uh, to see if we can identify any uniquely human psychological mechanisms. And so we are comparing apes, ideally of different ages, but we can't always do that, but to human children of different ages. So here's a little collaborative activity between two uh, kids. So I'm going to tell you about three aspects of the process, three component parts. One is getting started, the joint intention that we do something together uh, for our mutual benefit. The second is uh, the coordination and communication being a big part of that. Once we've got it started, we have to coordinate our activities toward this common end. And the third part is, of course, the third uh, component is, of course, um, well, you can see it there, the banana. The third component is um, sharing the spoils. Study of an 18-month-old kid. Um, I, I don't have my thing where I can stop it in the middle, so I'm sorry. It's going to have to run. Uh, and they're coordinating. Now you see the kid started to send it down the other. Uh, he's starting to send it down the other. He's kind of teasing. He sends it down this one. They're coordinating. The experiment is he stops. The adult stops interacting now. And now what does the kid do? 18-month-old now just pre-linguistic or just barely linguistic. You, Come do your part, he's saying. You know, what are you doing? He, gets, he has his hand stuck in the tube there, but he pulls it out, he extracts it. Come, 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 do your part. He communicates to get him back in. He beckons him back in, and they get going again. 
So this is, uh, we, we can't do the chimp in exactly the same one because what the chimps like to do is one of them would, would send the thing down and run down and catch it and push the other one out of the way, okay? Uh, but what they're doing here, a slightly different one, is the chimp, he's, this is with a, a human, this is a, hum, a chimp that wasn't, whose mom rejected her and is being raised by humans, uh, by zookeepers. And uh, she is, uh, uh, has to lift this plexiglass door and the human will then be able to uh, reach in and get the food and share it with her. And the trick again is going to be that the human stops for 15 seconds uh, acting, okay? All right, so now the human has gone still and now we want to see how the chimp reacts to that. Does the chimp, for example, communicate, say, come on back in, do your part? No, this is Annette, she's just frustrated. Now she comes in and tries to elbow the human out of the way to see if she can get it herself. Okay, and now the human is signaling the 15 seconds is over. This was a set period, the 15 seconds is over and she's signaling that she uh, wants to do it. And now they actually succeed. Uh, but the point is that uh, there was no communication, no coming back in. The human child had a joint goal and when you weren't participating, they said, come do your part. And the chimp is just saying, oh, you know, things happen. Um, you know, whatever, and I'll try to do it myself. <clears throat> um, if you were saying, why, what about collaborating with another chimp? Um, we tried that with them, and um, they almost never succeeded. When they did succeed, the one who reached in ate the whole thing, and so the one doing it stopped. And you're going to see a study of that in a minute. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, this is a, a study where I'm only going to show you the kid part. This is comparative with kids and chimps, and the idea is this. They're, they have to collaborate with this stick. They each have a stick. Uh, they, they each have one end of the stick. And there are two buckets there uh, with a reward for each of them. And they pull it up the steps. And the trick is that we made it so that one kid, okay, you can start it. One kid will get, her, the kid on the left will get her reward first. It's a surprise to them. But she's getting her reward early and the other one can't get hers because we have, on that step, we have her thing blocked. And so here we go, the one on the left, as soon as she gets hers up, now she's going to reach in and get her reward. She has to go somewhere else to cash in the reward. But she's coming over to investigate the plight of her partner. She sees the problem now, she didn't see it before. And she comes back and finishes it through and makes it so that the other girl can get her reward. Now they both go cash them in. Okay, uh, we have a control condition where they come in and there's no collaboration. They just come in and the first one just gets hers and the other one asks for help and she helps her some, but she helps her much more often if it's in the middle of a collaboration. So the collaboration facilitates this uh, helpful um, behavior. Um, we did this with the chimps. So the chimps are, they can pull things in. You're gonna see that example in a minute. They can pull some things in, uh, but um, one of them gets their reward first, takes the reward, that's it, game over. Okay. Anybody who knows anything about chimps could have predicted that. Once the one guy gets his um, food, it's over. So we often talk about the chimp version as the social tool way of collaborating. I know I need my partner, uh, but I'm kind of using him as a tool to get what I need. Uh, okay. Um, and finally, on this idea of getting things started, Ultimately, what humans do uh, in a lot of situations, uh, in, in sort of uncertain situations of collaboration, is they form a commitment, a joint commitment to collaborate. Uh, the commitment, there's a lot of literature and game theory on commitment um, having to do with me um, uh, trying to assure you that you can count on me in, a, in, a, in an interdependent situation. And so what we had here, this was a study about uh, turn taking, and it also has a joint commitment component. Uh, but the turn taking goes the following way. We have to collaborate to pull this thing over to one side and then only I get a reward, you get nothing. If we pull to the other side, only you get a reward and I get nothing. And the sort of natural solution for adult human beings is, well, let's take turns and we can both maximize. So they knew that it was gonna happen over and over and over again and they needed to find a strategy. Um, and so, um, uh, you're going to see them turn taking, but I'm going to point out one other thing before the film comes on. I put this here for joint commitment because what these little kids do, I will tell you that little preschool kids do not spontaneously generate joint commitments very readily or often, but we captured one on the screen here. And what you're going to see them doing is they're going to, this is in German, but they're going to say, uh, they're going to say, 
<laughs> Actually, the German word is the same as the English. Here. And the other one says, no, here. No, here. And what they're doing is saying, no, pull to my side. And they say, no, pull to my side. And then the other kids, and then one of them at one point says, okay, but then here, okay? And then you'll, you'll see, okay? And the other one, uh, that's <laughs> All right. So the, the the joint commitment is um, I'm not going to give a full theoretical analysis of joint commitment, but it's trying to ensure that I will sacrifice for you now if I get a commitment from you that you're going to sacrifice for me at the next step. And they spontaneously generate this, as I say, rarely, but uh, but nevertheless they can. So this is. Something I would say uniquely human for sure. It requires this cooperative communication where I, I explicitly lay out for you um, this um, um, assurance uh, that, I, that you can count on me. Um, but it's a way of getting things started that has some special qualities. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's the data that uh, for the uh, I focus on the joint commitment. That's the data for the turn taking. The kids, uh, over half of them, about sixty percent of them. These are three and five year olds. Over sixty percent of them um, found a turn taking solution. And as soon as one of the interesting things is, once they found a turn taking solution, some of them took a while to find it. Once they found it, they never went back. It was clearly the solution. Once they saw it, they had it. The chimps, we tried three different things to get them to do this. We simplified the task. We did it between trials and within trials. Uh, we couldn't get them to take turns at all. So taking turns obviously doesn't require you to be altruistic or anything at all. It just requires your long-term interest to see that you need to keep your partner uh, happy to keep going. Um, and the chimps don't have whatever it takes uh, to be able to do this in this paradigm in any case. Um, OK, so the second. Um, the second uh, component of this, that was, the, that was the joint intention, getting things started, having an agreement to pursue a joint goal together for mutual benefit. Now it's about coordinating to get that mutual benefit. Um, you can go ahead and start this. This is a, a rather long um, uh, video. This was actually an original, this was originally a study of helping. And this is a pilot kid where we were playing around with things. Um, and so uh, this is Felix Varnikin. He puts uh, the magazines in the cabinet, little 18 month old boy, Basically pre-linguistic, wandering around, not sure what's going on. And he helps him to open the cabinet. But now here, watch this. He says, they go there. <laughs> okay? And he looks up at him and he says, they go there. All right? So he's telling him his part. He's telling him what he needs to do with him. So while he's playing his role of opening the door, he's directing the other guy in his role. So he knows both roles of the collaboration. And now, by the way, he predicts the whole thing. So he anticipates. He doesn't wait till Felix has a problem. He opens ahead of time and says, they go there. OK? Has a little, a little troubleshooting here. The, the, th the door closes. He opens it again. And, uh, and then completes the whole process. OK? So uh, to, to me, th this, for me, is the birth of a, a cultural practice. The kid knows nothing that's going on. He sees the guy have a problem, he follows in and joins in, and, it's, and then the next time around, he actually knows the whole thing, anticipates the whole thing. Now, there are a lot of aspects of this, but what I want to focus on here is that the kid has both roles in mind. The, the kid is operating with both roles. So in the, when they're coordinating, the point is that he, can, he knows what both of them are doing. He can anticipate what the other guy needs. When the door starts to shut, he opens it back again because he knows the guy has, what the guy has to do. Um, and so this role reversal, uh, means that they're conceptualizing themselves as just one person in the role. And when you give them a chance to reverse roles and play the other role, they can do it. Can I see the next slide, please? So here's an experiment to test that. Um, this is the final test here. Uh, the final test is how, um, how quickly can you learn to play role B over there. So role B is, an, is a role in, an, in a collaborative activity, and we're going to test you to see how quickly you can learn that role, how, how well you learn it and how quickly you learn it. Okay, um, And the two conditions are, one is a baseline condition. The subject just comes in and plays role B, and we see how, quickly, how well they do it and how quickly they learn to do it. And the, uh, the key condition is where you've played role A previously. So you've played the other side of the collaborative activity. Uh, you've never played role B. Neither one of them has played role B, but one of them has played role A. And do you get value added if you've played that other role? Um, and the answer is uh, three-year-olds uh, have value added. They're much better at role A, at role B if they've played role A previously. And the chimps, there's no value added. So one 
possible conclusion is the chimps are not simulating the other guy in his role when they're collaborating uh, where the kids are. So this is part of the coordination process is really monitoring the other guy and what he's doing. <clears throat> so a, a kind of a general schematic that I think is key here in the collaboration that humans do, the, the, the cognitive structure, if you will, is the following. That we have a joint goal, and I haven't really mentioned it here, but I've done a lot of work on joint attention. So joint attention is where we focus on something together and we know that we're focused on it together. So you have joint goal and joint attention on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have our individual roles. I have my role, I bring the magazines over, you have your role, you open the door. So we're collaborating for a mutual end, but we have our individual roles. So it's the, it's the joint goal that generates roles. So this is why I object to, for example, Christoph Bosch talking about the chimps playing roles in, the, in, their, in their hunting, uh, because there's, if there's no joint goal, then there can't be roles. We talk about roles very generally, the role of rain and the ecosystem of the rainforest. I don't mean role that way. I mean th that they understand themselves to be playing a role. Tension, you and I are jointly attending to this, but I see it like this and you see it like that. So we are jointly attending, but yet you have your perspective and I have my perspective. We've written some theoretical papers arguing that the notion of perspective requires something in common that we have different perspectives on. If you just look out the window of the building this way and I look out the window that way, we're just seeing different things. It's, but if we're focused like this, then we have to have something in common that we are uh, focused on. Um, so um, I think two things about this kind of structure, I've called it the dual level structure. It's not a very elegant name, but I couldn't ever think of anything better. This dual level structure of sharedness and individuality all in one package, all in one schema, uh, has the idea of this role interchangeability, self other equivalence. Uh, you play this role, I play that role, we can, we can change it around. Um, uh, I think ultimately, feeds into the notion of fairness, that you and I are equally equal causal uh, agents in making this happen. We could play each other's roles. The criteria for playing the roles are the same whoever plays them. The person who does role A has to do X, Y, and Z. The person who role, plays role B has to do A, B, and C. The criteria for the roles are impartial and the exchangeability of partners uh, somehow uh, uh, is part of what leads us to think of self-other equivalence and somehow notion of fairness. I believe it's, I don't think it's the whole thing, but I think it plays a role. Joint attention is different perspectives, um, as I said. Okay, so part of this coordination is communication. Uh, so you, you can go ahead and run this. So um, uh, this is a little task where there's a, t there's, a, there's a toy inside that's fun and they're pulling apart. But again, Felix is going to be difficult. This is the whole, the whole experiment is the adult being difficult. And you're going to see the little boy watch. There, there, he points. Do that. Okay, grab the end. Do, you know, do your part. So this to me is, is the sort of natural home of cooperative communication for exactly the reason that I said uh, before about helping in general. So you can think about that point as an act of helping. Uh, I am helping you play your role by telling you what to do. But of course, that's directly in my benefit, because if you don't play your role, then we don't succeed. So I'm helping you. This is exactly the context I was saying, where I think a lot of the uh, extra part of uh, altruism that humans uh, in, engage in is um, uh, in helping is in this context where we're doing something mutualistically. OK? Um, that was producing uh, um, uh, a piece of cooperative communication that's supposed to be helpful to your partner. Um, here's comprehension. Um, okay, so this is as simple a study as it gets. This is a 12-month-old baby, a prelinguistic. The other one uh, was about 18 months. This is 12 months, and um, she's going to hide this toy in one of these places. The kid doesn't know where it is. She centers him, and then she just points. And sure enough, the kid finds it. And you say, wow, you know, you developmental psychologists, really. I mean, how, why would you do such a silly, uh, simple little study? Well, the reason is that um, this is not a foregone conclusion. Uh, I invite you to go to the zoo and go pick out any animal you want and tell them, food's over there. Okay? They don't get it. This is part of the preparation is being able to receive cooperative communication, to trust it, and to go with it. So. Um, as, as part of that, I will show you, uh, you can go ahead and roll this. Uh, here's what happens when you do it with chimps. Where the food is hidden. 
Half the time, the chimpanzee picks the wrong cup. It doesn't understand that the researcher is trying to help it. So, so we have we have done this study probably a dozen times uh, with different people. I, we have students coming to the lab all the time saying, I don't believe that. I don't believe that when you point to where the food is, the chimp won't know where it is. And I'm sorry, they don't. We tried it. This is not one study. This is a whole series. They don't get it. One reason is they don't, they, they, their understanding of communication is that individuals are communicating to get what they want. So they communicate with other all the time, but each the individual is communicating wants the other guy essentially do this, do what I tell you to do. All right, and the other guy, if he has reason to comply, he complies. If not, he doesn't. But to say, chimps don't experience in their everyday life, uh, oh, here's some food over here. If you want some, uh, I'm, I don't care for it. You have it yourself. Okay, they don't experience that in their everyday lives. This sort of cooperative communication. Uh, so they don't, uh, they're not uh, um, doing that. So, um, okay, so it is not, by the way, that chimps can't make an inference. Um, so if you modify this study and turn it into a competitive version, here's, wh here's what we do. We compete with the chimp. I have a, a human competes with the chimp for food. And the food comes over here where the chimp might be able to get it, and the human grabs it first. So they're getting in this, in this competitive um, format. And now um, the food is next to me in these, one of these two buckets. The chimp doesn't know where it is. And I reach for one like this, and I try, but I, I, I'm actually reaching through plexiglass, and I can't reach it. And I... Uh, uh, and I don't ever even look at the chimp. And now somebody else pulls it, pushes it over to the chimp, and now he knows where the food is. So he can make the inference. He's trying to get in there. There must be something good in there. The dogs can make this inference too, by the way. He's trying to get in there. There must be something good in there. That's essentially a, that's in a competitive context. But what he can't, the inference he can't make is he wants me to know that the food is over there. Okay? So the chimp is essentially... Um, uh, uh, when you point for the kid, um, the kid uh, is essentially uh, saying he wants me to know where the food is. And the chimp doesn't make that inference. This has a recursive structure to it. And I think this is one of the key differences in human cognition and great ape cognition as well, is this recursive step that you get when um, um, you embed one mental state in uh, another one. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so um, then let me just um, uh, uh, summarize that, that when we, are, um, when we are coordinating our collaborative activity, human children do all kinds, they know the role the other one is playing, they know the, 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 the specs for his role, uh, they communicate to help him play his role, they're simulating his role, and the chimps are uh, really not doing that. The humans cooperate, the human children cooperate, um, uh, communicate cooperatively, helping the other guy play his role, um, and the chimps uh, don't do that. We have done, I don't know, over a dozen studies of chimp cooperation of various kinds. They never communicate when they're collaborating. We had one study that I'm not going to show you today where it was a kind of a, uh, over here was better for one of them and over here was better for the other one. And they just kind of, you know, and there was nobody saying, come, you know, you, you come over here. You know, nothing to try to persuade the other one to come. So when, they, when there's a potential for collaboration, and during the collaboration, they don't communicate. Again, when they're doing the group hunting with monkeys, they scream with excitement, but they don't have any particular communicative uh, uh, things to help the other guys play their role. Okay, now we come to the third component. The third component is sharing the spoils, and I'm calling it the third component. But in point of fact, uh, I think this is probably one of the major constraints uh, on the chimps in evolution, because you, as you will see, they're doing they're going to do some incredibly sophisticated things uh, with regard to the actual collaboration itself. Uh, so this is a task where they both have to pull in order to pull that board in. The rope is strung through a couple of hooks, and if I just pull the rope myself, it just comes loose. I have to wait for the other guy to pull. They have to be trained uh, um, to learn to inhibit pulling the rope, but it takes, it, it takes them just a few hours to learn how to do this. So after a few hours, they know that there's no point in pulling. They've got to wait for a partner, and once they've had that uh, understanding, once they get that, then they can move on to this. All right, so in this is um, this is one where they're pulling, and you can see that the food. Okay, you can go. The food is separated into two so piles on each end. Do. Okay. Now watch. This is incredible. I've really never been so really? surprised. I don't think in my life. He goes and opens the door for his partner. He knows he needs a partner, and uh, he even will go actively open the door for him. And now they pull in, and 
Okay, so the guy, they're successful. In this the guy goes and uh, makes sure he gets a partner, does something active to get his partner. But now we're going to put the food in the middle. <laughs> right? The food is in the middle now. Uh, and so essentially in the first one, we, separate, we solved the problem of dividing the spoils for them. And now we didn't solve it for them. And look what happens. This guy is very unenthusiastic. And the dominant takes all the food. But the dominant chimpanzee grabs all the food. So again, this is this is this is the natural thing. Chimps are uh, like most, like many mammals. Chimps uh, solve conflicts over food by dominance. That's just the way they do it. So they're not odd in that way. Uh, humans are the odd ones of of uh, using dominance sometimes, but using other things as well. Um, so um, uh, can I see the next one, please? All right. So I'm going to show you two version, two kids. Um, two films of kids doing this. The first one is two little boys that are three years old. Uh, and I chose this one because it, had, it bears some resemblance to that chimp one. All right, so these are gummy bears. <laughs> and there are four gummy bears in the middle. I'm not going to show you the one where, there's, where the food is separated already. There are four gummy bears in the middle. And they start to pull. And now the, this is like the dominant chimp. He comes over and he's first. The other one hadn't figured out what's going on. He's still looking on his side. He's actually going to say they're none in mine, meaning none on my side. Uh, he's, he means none on my side. But then he comes over. You can't really see there, but he starts to take three. And the other kid says, no. And then he only takes two. And that kid takes two. And then they and then they compare they compare their thing. They can do this all day. Okay, this is a stable strategy, uh, and they uh, they've worked it out. We get kids uh, almost net. Well, I'm going to show you what happens when there is a hiccup. Okay, all right. So here are two little girls, and they they pull. They're three years old. Also, they pull a little too hard, and the gummy bears come out on the floor. Maybe that's why they think they can scramble. One girl takes three, and the other girl protests. And she relents and gives it back to her. So in this study, they almost always took two apiece. Three-year-olds can deal with small numbers with two and two. They almost always took two apiece. Um, and if one of them took three, the other one almost always protested, and the protester almost always gave it up. Right Now, here's what's important. This is not about wanting more gummy bears. If it was about wanting more gummy bears, I should hassle you when you take two, because I want three, I want four, I want them all. But they don't hassle them when the other guy takes just two, because two versus two is fair, right? And so they, uh, uh, they, have this, uh, they know how the division should go. Moreover, during these protests, and I put, I, we actually put a lot of importance in these protests, because the protests are not, I want more. The protests are, hey, what are you doing? Oh, OK, OK. All right. Now, for that to happen, for me to say, hey, what are you doing, and you to put one of them back, notice the, the guy doesn't put two back. Of course, he doesn't put two back. She only puts one back to make it even. So I'm essentially saying, you know what you're doing wrong. Fix it. And you say, OK, you're right. I know what's wrong here. And it's fixed. So they both know in their common ground, it's common knowledge among them, how this should be divided. And if one of them violates it, they just call the other one on it. And they refer to this common understanding. And they divide it two and two. So we decided to um, follow this up with um, an even trickier version. So here they are. They're getting ready to pull. Uh, and they're four marbles. They, they use these marbles. You can see the little tip of the game there. And they put them down this thing, and they make a noise. You can see, you'll hear it at the end. And they, and they really like doing this game. They get excited about it. So here's the trick. The trick is they're, they're collaborating to produce these marbles. But then uh, you'll see what happens. Whoops. Three and I get three, and you only get one. And what does he do? He evens it out. OK. Three-year-olds are three-year-olds are characterized in most of the literature as being pretty selfish, and they're pretty selfish because in a dictator game or any kind of sharing game, you give the kid four, and you say you can ha give however many you want to to your friend. They might give one, right? But they they wouldn't give two. Um, so we actually had a control condition where uh, they came into the room, and it was already three on my side and one on your side. And they gave it up about 10% of the time. They gave one. 
But in the condition you just saw there, where they collaborated and their three come to me and one goes to him, 80% of the time they gave it up. So I don't know, that, I don't, I'm not sure why this um, uh, study doesn't get cited more than it does. This is the earliest age by far of kids showing an aversion to an advantageous inequity. Um, the age that you see in literature is eight years old and things like that. Um, because the, the title of this paper is, uh, and by the way, chimps, they don't actively share, but we made it so that they could uh, protect the extra one. So it was, um, I got two and you got one, and there was a third one in the middle that I could either protect or not protect uh, fr from you getting it. And uh, it didn't matter whether we collaborated or didn't collaborate. I, did, I, I, I pretty much protected it every time. Um, so uh, um, uh, it's the collaborative context that somehow generates the idea that there should be equality uh, between us. Uh, I should say we ran another control condition for those of you who are freaks on control conditions where they each pulled individually. So I pulled and got my, and you pulled and you got yours, and I got three and you got one, and they shared um, like 30 something percent of the time. So it was still significantly different from the one where they collaborated. Um, so something about the collaborative context generates this notion of um, sharing in an equal way. Um, now, finally, um, excluding free riders. Uh, I, I told you when, about the chimp, um, um, the, the, the chimps um, collaborative hunting of monkeys in the wild. Uh, they don't exclude free riders. If you read, especially the best paper is Bosch 1994. Um, uh, the ones who do the hunting, uh, the ones who are actually active in the hunt end up getting more food, but the free riders come in and always get food and they get almost as much as the hunters most of the time. So uh, we did a little study. I'm going to leave out one of the key variables. One of the variables was how close. So, so our hypothesis was what's really key is that the guys who are doing the hunting, they are close to the kill site when the thing is captured. And they're right there, and they're excited because they've been hunting. And they gather around the monkey, and they start pulling at it, and they start eating it together. And then the, 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 um, uh, the bystanders who didn't do anything, they come up later. And there's a group of chimps around the thing, and they can't get their head in there. And they, you know, so, so they're not getting as much because uh, they're late to the party, basically. Uh, so we actually modeled that here. And I'm not, I won't talk about the closer variable, but, but guys who were closer when the, when, when, it, when the food came got more food. But that's not the key variable I'm going to say here. So what we did was we modified our task so that now we got this rope. And it can be pulled in either by one individual or collaboratively, one or the other. And the food always goes to that guy you see on the left. So there's always the food goes just to one side. And so the variable is whether this second guy actually pulled also, so the food came to this one guy as a result of our collaborative effort, or he didn't pull at all. And this guy was able to pull it in by himself. We changed, we tied the rope and so that he could pull it by himself. Okay. And the question is, would he share more? with somebody who collaborated with him than somebody who was a free rider, who hadn't, who hadn't uh, participated. Um, and we did the same thing with three-year-old children. And you can, you're, you're probably seeing the pattern now. You can guess the result that the children, but not the chimps, excluded the free riders. The children did not uh, share with the person who didn't participate. To be fair, I have to say that to make this work, we had in the kid case, we had to have the other partner when he was not collaborating say, nah, I don't want to play that game. I'm going to play this more fun game over here. Uh, and then when the other guy got the food, he said, oh, I'll have some of that too. And so he said, what are you talking about? No, get out of here. So uh, the kids, uh, these are five-year-old kids, um, uh, uh, exclude the free riders. The chimps don't care. The chimp, it doesn't matter whether you participated or didn't participate, whether you're a collaborator or not a collaborator. Um, uh, you get the same amount of food. We gave them a non-monopolizable or a partially monopolizable resource. It was a half of a watermelon, <laughs> so I can hold it and get it, but you can still come and grab some. So it's a, it's a um, situation of tolerating the other guy taking some. The chimps don't care whether you were a collaborator or not. It's the same. The kids care. Okay. Okay, so those are my three components, and so I'm arguing to you that what we can see in human children today are adaptations for mutualistic collaboration uh, that you don't see in our nearest primate relatives. Um, I will say that, that, for example, the study where the kids are pulling in and it goes three to me and one to you, um, I get people saying things, uh, giving me all kinds of explanations that their parents taught them they should share. And that's why they're doing it. Well, yes, but um, 
uh, for that to work, you have to, ex you have to s explain the difference between the experimental and the controlled condition. So that would mean we have to have parents around there who say, share equally when you collaborate with somebody, but when you don't collaborate, you can keep it all. It's fine. Okay? And I think that's unlikely. I also think other explanations uh, that would be of a more biological variety, like reputation and all those sorts of things, I don't think those are different in the two cases. You know, uh, So uh, if I'm trying to create a good uh, reputation or I'm trying to create a situation of reciprocity, I should give you one in both conditions. right? I should give it to you in both conditions. Why should it matter? The collaborative context matters. That's the key. So. Um, 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 yes, all, all these other explanations, of course, apply in some way at some level. I'm trying to say the extra part that humans are doing is coming mainly from uh, these adaptations for collaborating. And let me just say one other thing is that I think when we're talking about um, in evolutionary psychology, we talk about humans being adapted for things. Uh, and quite often, we're interested in things that are quite, uh, quite confined, quite local. Uh, uh, things. But if they're adapted for collaboration, this includes all kinds of things, right? All the, at least the three components I have there and other things as well are all part of that. So if you're adapted for collaboration, you're adapted for all of its component parts. Uh, and you can have individuals who are adapted in different ways with the different component parts and it'd be quite complicated. But I'm just, it, it trickles down from the, from the overall, uh, in these complex uh, behaviors that have lots of components, uh, the adaptive, um, uh, the adaptive landscape, as it were, trickles down into the component parts. Okay, so one, I um, uh, uh, just want to um, uh, conclude with a few more things. Um, um, one of them is the following, that um, um, all, uh, roughly 200 species of primates, 199 of them have eyes that look like the chimps on the left there. One of them has eyes that look like on the right there. All of them, ha all the non-human primates, all primates have white sclera, but you can only see them in most of the primates if they look to the side. You can't see them in a straight ahead look or you can only see tiny parts of them. Um, and humans uh, are, um, the white sclera is a, a huge part of the eye that you can see even looking straight ahead. Uh, some Japanese researchers had um, uh, did the measurements there and had mentioned the idea of a, this might be something to do with cooperation. We followed up on this. The idea would be that uh, it's easy to see, to say why it would be adaptive for you to be able to follow my gaze direction, but why is it adaptive for me that you follow my gaze direction? And so we're thinking that advertising my eye direction um, would only evolve in a cooperative context. And if I'm competing, then I don't want you to see where I'm looking. I don't want you to see the food when I see it. I don't want you to see the predator coming when I see it. So, um, you know, uh, 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 professional poker players, they put on their sunglasses so you can't see where I'm looking when they're, when they're competing. Um, and so we just tested uh, one. It, it, this is definitely not a, an airtight um, a connection from the behavior back to any evolutionary circumstances. But we, something that's at least consistent with it is the following. We did a gaze following experiment, and it's a two by two design. And the two by two is either my eyes go up or my head goes up or both. So, um, so in the, the key, uh, so in, in, in the, in the, so the, the both condition, I look up with my eyes. The neither condition, I, I, I'm not looking up and my eyes are closed. But the key conditions are the corner conditions. Uh, and that would be eyes only, my head stays the same. Or my eyes are closed and my head goes up. And so with that two by two, you can tell, are they following the eyes or are they following the head? And the answer is, chimps follow the head. So if you look up with your eyes, they don't follow. If you turn your head up, even with your eyes closed, they follow. And the kids follow the eyes. So they follow the eyes but they don't follow the head if your eyes are closed, right? So this is at least consistent with the idea that these large whites of the eyes um, are, um, are uh, at least partially have to do with following the gaze direction of others. It's functional in that way now. Uh, that could be joint attention. We're, we're working together. I want you to see where I'm looking. I advertise my eye direction to facilitate our cooperation, just like I cooperatively communicate to facilitate our cooperation. Remember, in coordination, I want you to read my mind. In competition, I don't. So in any case, this is at least consistent with that. I understand there are other hypotheses uh, that you could have. Um, uh, and this is only only one little study. We did we did do a, a, a cross cultural study. A lot of people have mentioned uh, 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 Joe Henrik sitting there with his weird 
paper uh, that all you know the kids, the little German kids there, are uh, are weird in the uh, in the in the Henrik sense of weird, uh, and they're um, doing these uh, pro-social things and all because they're so socialized and so forth. Uh, we did a very small scale. Um, uh, cross-cultural study with rural, non-literate uh, uh, individuals from Peru and from India, and then some middle-class kids and parents from Canada. And all those dots, all those little dashes mean no difference in age of emergence. We did a little battery of tasks in each one of these things, and we're not just looking, do they do them or not, do they do them, start doing them at the same age? And they're all pointing at the same age. They're imitating in the same ways at the same age. They're reading intentions at the same age. They're gaze following at the same age. They're collaborating and joint attention at the same age. There's a slight difference in one direction with pointing and the other with collaboration between India and Canada. But basically, it's, it's all emerging in the same age. Why? I mean, these are one-year-olds now. These are kids between one and two years old. I think that fits everybody's uh, general intuition that cross-culturally, one-year-olds are not that different, five-year-olds are very different. One-year-olds, these are all things that are not things that vary across cultures. These are things that enable children to become members of culture. You become a member of a culture by learning to communicate, by pointing, by, by reading intentions, by imitating, by collaborating. So these are very basic skills of cultural learning and cultural interaction uh, that seem to be at least um, uh, uh, based on this very small sample, widespread, if not um, universal in the human species. So we have a physical morphological characteristic, the whites of the eyes, we have cross-cultural, so this looks like it's very uh, robust characteristic of uh, the human species. So I told you I'm not going to say much about culture, and I'm not, because you can't do everything in one talk, and I can, I just want, I, I've done a lot of the research on this earlier collaboration stage, and a little bit less on the culture part, but I would just say, in my latest thinking about this, I think about culture as basically scaled up collaboration at some point in human evolution, presumably modern humans. Um, um, all of a sudden now there's interdependence among everyone in the group. Uh, our group is one big collaborative activity. We, f we do foraging together. We have divided, we have a division of labor uh, is starting to um, take place. Um, and in that situation, just like I invest in my partner by helping my partner in this one big collaborative activity of culture, um, I invest in my in-group in, and its members. I invest in the group and its members because my survival depends on the survival of my uh, group mates. Uh, some of you may know the Timothy Clutton Brock has this idea with his, um, with his uh, cooperative uh, breeding um, um, Boop, uh, meerkats uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, group. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Uh, the the uh, uh, the group augmentation. That I'm living in a group, and and I need to have alarm callers, and I need to have mating partners, and I need to have this, and I need to have that. Um, and so I'm invested in all of my social partners, all of the people in my group. And if my group starts diminishing in size, I'm in trouble. So in any case, interdependence among everyone in the group, and so I invest in my in group. Uh, members. Uh, if there was competition with other groups, as um, Boyd and Richardson, as well as um, um, Gintis and Bowles, have talked about competition with other groups, uh, then outgroup people are like, they're analogous to free riders in the collaboration situation. In the collaboration situation, we put in all the work. You can't just come in and take all the spoils if we put in all the work. Well, if we're one big collaborative activity, the culture, then we can't just have outsiders coming in and taking advantage of all the work that we put in. Obviously, um, as, as everyone knows, and when you model um, cooperation evolutionarily, uh, you can't have free riding uh, or it all falls apart. Um, and finally, in the third person, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the cultural group, you get social norms and third person punishment, something again that Boyd and Richardson have emphasized in large group cooperation. You need social norms and third party punishment to keep cooperation going uh, as, an additional, um, as an additional enforcement uh, mechanism, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, the cognitive skills, cognitive skills and motivations underlying this, this transition to culture uh, um, would be, here are some very concrete things. There are obvious things like social institutions and stuff, that, but obvious things, but I'm talking about subtle things. Uh, we have uh, two st uh, studies showing apes do not punish third party. Um, so, for example, if I'm, an ape, if I'm a chimp and you steal my food, I retaliate against you. But if you steal somebody else's food, I don't care. So we have that 
uh, published a few years ago. Uh, and by the way, it can even be my offspring whose food you steal, and I don't care, uh, at least in our study. Uh, so um, third-party punishment is key to the sort of Boyd and Richardson story in large-scale cooperation. Um, apes don't care about self-reputation, that is, Part of what makes social norms work is, I know you're going to get on my case if I break the norm. I, I can already anticipate that coming, and so I'm trying to make sure you don't think I'm so, uh, I care about, so I am more careful if you're watching, and uh, we have a study showing that kids will, uh, are more generous if somebody's watching, uh, and they will steal less. So they give more, and they steal less if somebody's watching. Chimps don't care. The chimp, they chimps do whatever they do. It doesn't matter if others are watching or not watching. They don't care. So this combination of third-party enforcement and me worrying about my reputation from these third-party onlookers uh, is uh, key to large-scale cooperation, again, following the Boyd and Richardson model. Um, uh, uh, apes are not group-minded. Yes, apes know about their group, but what they know is the individuals they know. They're familiar with the ones in their group. Anybody who's not familiar is a stranger and they freak out. Uh, so there is that sense of group. But group-minded in the sense of uh, five-year-old kids, uh, you can do these minimal group things. You guys are in the yellow group and you guys are in the green group and they do all kinds of group things just based on arbitrary assignment to groups. So uh, kids are group-minded from about five years of age in, in that very um, narrow and powerful sense. Uh, instance of enforcing a social norm. Now notice the, the, the key is this is third party. Nothing has happened to this child, but the child has been shown how to play the game. So these are just a rule game. Here's how you play the game. The game is called Daxing. And now a puppet's going to come in. You have to use a puppet because they don't like correcting adults. They're too shy for that. But the puppet is going to not play the game the right way. And you'll see what the kid does. Again, this is German, but you don't, you don't need to know German to see what's happening here. No, it doesn't go like that. It doesn't go like that at all. No, it doesn't go like that. The puppet is playing it the wrong way. No, it doesn't go like that. No, it doesn't go like that. Here, you have to take this. And now he's showing him how to do it. So he's, he's, he's third party uh, intervention and you're doing it the wrong way. It doesn't work like that. And now teaching him how to do it. All third party, the child is not affected. This is not a game and you're not playing the right way, it ruins it for me. This is just observing the other guy doing it. No, you're not doing it right. I have lots of other cute films of these little German kids saying, nine, nine. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, uh, but we have it in some other cultures as well. But uh, 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 again, this third party intervention, social norms are agreed upon things. Why would I enforce it? It's obvious why I follow social norms if I'm a child. I follow social norms to fit in, to not get punished, to do what does my parents expect me to do, and so forth and so on. But why do I enforce them? What's the motivation for enforcing a social norm if you're a three-year-old? Well, this is not the way things work. This is the wrong way to do it. What else do I have to say? All right, so it's, it comes naturally to us in some way. Um, Okay, I said I would say just a little bit of a word of ontology, just very quick, one slide. I just want to say the following, that we've been thinking a lot about um, um, how this stuff works in ontogeny. And um, uh, obviously, all the studies are with kids, but uh, what I've focused on in the main part of my talk is just this comparison with chimps. But um, one of the interesting things is kids up to three years of age, so this is basically pre-weaning age in the, in the traditional, um, in the, in the um, ancestral environment. This is up to uh, pre-weaning age. What you have is kids doing uniquely human things, like joint attention, collaboration, cooperative communication, uh, all these kinds of things that the chimps are not doing, that I showed you they're not doing, but they're doing them all with adults, okay? Every study I showed you, when you saw the kids collaborating together, they were at least three. Kids below three, terrible at it. I don't know if any of you have kids, but you put your one and a half year old down to next another one and a half year old, you do not see deep and meaningful social interactions. They operate in parallel. And this is all the way up to two year olds, a little something, but not that much. When they get to be three, they can actually relate to peers uh, in a much, uh, um, a much more meaningful way. So one, this is uh, obviously uh, straight out of uh, Sarah Hurdy and Kirsten Hawks has um, written, uh, um, she wrote a criticism of one of our papers that we then responded to in this human nature coming out soon where we took their criticism to heart. Um, that um, if you think of this um, ontogenetically that these early things may have evolved in a cooperative breeding context to bond with the adult. And, then, and I, I actually think there was a pin, kind of a pincer movement. Cooperative uh, um, uh, foraging 
with the adults. And the kids are getting these, skill, these ways of soliciting adult care and attention in, a, in the cooperative breeding context where they have multiple adults and they've got lots of siblings and peers to compete with for adult attention. So they're using these things there and the adults need more of these skills up here in, 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 in adulthood for coordinating their collaborative activities. And this is like a perfect, uh, a perfect pincher movement in ontogeny um, um, uh, where uh, both of them are at work. And so now, uh, uh, the kids you saw collaborating together are all three to five year olds. They have what uh, Piaget called the two social worlds of childhood. The two social worlds of childhood are um, my interactions with adults. And from age three on, we get a lot of adult pedagogy. I know there's controversy about how much pedagogy in different cultures, but I think the consensus is coming around now that there's clear pedagogy in all cultures in one form or another. It doesn't take the form that ours does, but it does in other cultures. Um, so, uh, and then, and peers are now, from now on, going to be the key person to coordinate with. You coordinate with parents when they kind of adapt to you and whatnot, and they get down on your level, but yeah, they're never really on your level, right? So the peers are the ones where they don't know any more than I do. My little three-year-old partner over there is as dumb as I am, right? They got to work this out, we have to work it out ourselves. We have to work out how to divide the spoils ourselves. If I do something with mom, she's going to legislate how we divide the stuff at the end. She's going to tell me one of those rules. Yeah, yeah, divide it equally. Okay, I know. But if you're with a peer, you have to work it out for yourself. And you have to worry about your reputation. You have to worry about being cheated. So it's peers that are really providing the context for all this stuff uh, to develop um, uh, from age three or so on. And they're developing after age three uh, the uh, skills of collective intentionality, group mindedness. They're starting to understand that they're in a group um, between three to five, depending on what you're looking at, what your criteria are. They're social norms. They're not just following social norms. They are um, enforcing social norms. And we have some very cute studies of five-year-olds creating social norms themselves, where we tell them, oh, here's some stuff, play with it however you want, and they start playing with it, they come up with ways of playing with it, and then they start saying, oh, but you have to do it this way, and you can't do it this way, and a new kid comes in, no, you can't do it that way, you have to do it this way, and this is with nothing coming from adults. They make these up themselves. It's really about five where you, before you really get that, but they're creating their own cultural norms in this little localized um, setting of a game uh, uh, context. Okay, so I'll just conclude by giving you a little advertisement of the two recent books that John was so kind to plug. Uh, uh, I give essentially this evolutionary story that I just um, told you about uh, with regard to cognitive skills. In this book, um, I argue that uh, humans have cognitive representations that are perspectival. We see the same object in front of us as a dog or an animal or a pet or a pest. We can see the same thing from different perspectives as we please. We take that for granted, but I think you don't see that in other species anything like the same way. They don't, they can't say, let's construe this as a pet, let's construe it as an animal, let's construe it as a dog. Depend, just depends on how you look at it. They don't, they don't do that, is, is the proposal. Uh, and I, again, here I'm not saying a lot about the positive aspects of all the incredible things that apes do. There I have a long thing on all, all the incredible stuff that apes do cognitively, but then the humans have this special thing. And the inferences they make are recursive, especially you thinking about what I'm thinking about your thinking uh, that I don't think apes do. We have no evidence for that. And I didn't really get into it, but the norms of rationality, ultimately, ultimately I guide my thinking by what is rational in my, in my group. Uh, and the other one is, is the natural history of human morality. And this is more about the cooperation side of it, the motivational side of it. I didn't stress this, but um, the interdependence leads to the notion of we over me. And this is the key to my approach to the uh, evolution of human morality, is it's not about reputation in the sense of I'm worried about what they think of me, because I myself am also someone who judges other people. And I judge people based on what we in the community think is the right and wrong way to do things. And when I transgress, I take that perspective of the we. I take the perspective as, as if I were someone else transgressing. And so I say, and so, so I feel guilty. How do you explain guilt? I mean, okay, my, my, my explanation for guilt is I'm taking the perspective of the, of the group on me. Okay, I did this little thing and you know, now I'm saying, oh gosh, I shouldn't have done that. I feel terrible about it. The we is taking precedence over the me. So it's related to the reputational thing, but I want I think the extra power, where does the moral force get its extra power? It's, the, it's actually a, 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 an idea first talked about by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but it's the we over the me. 
uh, and the role exchangeability um, and this equal criteria in the roles, I think that's where we get the notion that we're equal participants in a collaboration um, and, um, and, th and this notion of fairness. I do think that this is, um, again, a big part of the story is that um, uh, of fairness, of the notion of fairness and um, impartiality comes from the idea that I see you as somebody just like me that has the same wants and desires as me, that worked just as hard as I did. So it's not a motivation. This, this is a key thing. I would really like it if I was more important than all you guys. Okay? I deserve more. Okay? That, that's, my mo that's, that's my desire. My desire is that I'm more important and I get everything and you guys get nothing. But it doesn't matter. I can't convince myself that you guys aren't real and that, you, and that you don't want things and deserve things as much as I do. So it's like an insight. It's not a motivation. It's an insight that others are equal. They're, to me, they're interchangeable. They're, you're like me. And so I can't make myself think that I deserve more, even if I want that to be the case. I can't make myself think that I deserve more than you do because you're over there doing the same thing. I'm doing. Why should I deserve more? So I think this notion of impartiality and fairness can only come out of collaborative activities where we're uh, uh, working together for mutual benefit. Okay, so the conclusions are quite easy. Human children are adapted for collaboration in ways that great apes are not, all the ways I elaborated, and these adaptations are fundamental to uniquely human processes of cognition, communication, culture, and morality. Thank you very much. You're talking about intergroup conflicts. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on any type of coordination or communications that That's a really interesting case. So, um, and I don't think we know as much about it as we need to. This so-called boundary patrols, where they seem to go out and on the edge of their thing and whatever, um, and so they're. It's unclear for sure. I think. Um, I think. Um, Ian Gilby. Uh, has a, a study where he shows that it's a little more opportunistic than that and not quite the boundary patrol, something like that. Uh, uh, but what they're, argue, what they're against, what, what they're worried about is strangers. So what the humans have this special thing that we in this group do things this way. We talk this language, we dress this way, we eat this way. Those guys on the other side of the river, they dress funny, they talk funny, they eat disgusting things. They're not us. They're, we, we tend to dehumanize them, in-group, out-group. One of the most robust findings in all of social psychology is in-group, out-group psychology. So yes, chimps have some notion of their group and those who are not in their group. I, there's, no, there's clear about that. But I think it's mainly based on familiarity uh, with the ones that they're familiar with. Um, and humans have this weird thing. I mean, one of the absolutely most astounding findings, that, and, and it's highly replicable, is take five-year-old kids and put green t-shirts on these and yellow t-shirts on these and say, you're in the green group and you're in the yellow group. And these incredible things happen where they are they favor their in-group and they want people to defect in the out-group and screw. It's incredible. So, so I, I'm, I'm not saying that chimps don't have a sense of their group. I'm saying that humans have this extra thing that I was calling group-minded that I didn't really have time to explain. That this in-group, out-group psychology based on just uh, similarity. So in social psychology, there are two major ways of creating solidarity among individuals. One is working together collaboratively, and the other is similarity. You look alike, you talk alike, you have a lot in common. If you look at how these people who fall in love and get married over the internet, the story is always the same. We love the same music. We like the same movies, okay? They have these common interests. So they bond and based on similarities. So you bond based on working together or on similarities. The bonding, working together is collaboration. Similarities is culture. So even the yellow group. So all I'm saying is not that chimps don't know their group, but that humans have this special group mindedness that, um, that I didn't really explain, but I hope I elaborated at least a little there. Just to follow up on Deb's question, um, I mean, it seems like when they, when the three chimps or four chimps 
Okay, I, I did mention. I did mention. I mean, that coalitions and alliances are, are are pervasive in the in the mammalian world and beyond. But um, uh, coalitions and uh, mobbing of predators by birds and all kinds of things. So mobbing, mobbing predators uh, attacking the other guy in a side by side kind of thing. Yes. Okay. The, I, Mention that as one context they do it. But um, uh, I don't think it takes a lot of coordination. They all attack the same guy uh, in a sort of a parallel fashion. They don't say, you go around behind him and I'll go over to this side of him. So um, um, it's coordinated in the sense they're acting at the same time on the same object, but it's not coordinated beyond that. Uh, so I would say it is coordinated in that sense, but that obviously humans coordinate a lot more uh, complex ways. There's planning, there's communication during, uh, there's monitoring the other guy's role. Our study showed they're not really monitoring the other guy's role, at least in our study. So um, again, I, I guess maybe I oversold my case or overstated. I didn't mean to say that they don't know anything about their group or they don't coordinate at all, but I'm trying to highlight the special forms of group mindedness and coordination that goes on in humans, even in very young kids. And um, I think the fact that it's young kids um, helps a lot. There are a lot of reasons for doing studies with kids that are especially interesting. In a lot of studies with adults, I worry about, you know, what do they think is going on and all that. These little three-year-olds, they're not thinking about what's going on in the study. They're just doing their natural thing. So um, in any case, um, I maybe overstated the chimp negativity there, but um, uh, yes, they're coordinating, but only in the limited sense, I would say. So, uh, it seems that the No, we have not played around with the balance in power between the two kids. We have not. Um, uh, we we have we have played around with it. But we haven't done anything systematic with it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. But but one of the things that one of the things that happens that we have so okay siblings is a special case. We have Frank Soloway here. We'll give you a lecture on on, on the sibling competition and whatnot. Uh, siblings is a different case because they're, comp they're in competition for resources all the time as well. But when you put these little kindergartners together, we have done it with some older kids and younger kids. The older kids, they tend to feel paternalistic toward the little ones, and they don't just dump, assert their power. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to believe that adults get more license to do that as they get older. But young kids are very cooperative. I'm not talking about siblings competing for resources, but these little kids in kindergartens, they tend to be very cooperative and they don't tend to be very greedy for the things. And um, uh, we have varied the, the value of the thing, of the value of the thing they're cooperating for. And if it gets more valuable, uh, uh, they don't get more selfish because they know the other guy wants it as bad as they do. They know the other guy's willing to fight more if you want to look at it that way because they're more valuable. But the answer to your question is no, we have not explored that to the degree that we ought to. And we have not explored um, if, um, um, if one of the partners is more um, uh, valuable to the uh, collaboration, more skillful and knowledgeable and whatever, does that give, def do you give deference to him? Uh, um, but um, so that's, that's remaining, remaining to be done. Yeah, Peter. <laughs> Yeah. Well, as, as you know, one of the limitations of the kind of traditional psychological research is that that's error variance, right? So uh, we may have some kids like that, and they would have not done it, and and they would have given a zero to their group, but we didn't really we didn't really single them out and identify them. So uh, uh, yeah, and I, I would I would say that you know the the, the sociopaths are really um, you know would be a really um, interesting. Uh, test case here because uh, they would be going by this pure reputational thing of what they think of me and those kinds of things. And I'm think I'm saying that the normally developing kids um, 
have a genuine sense that the other guy deserves as much as I do. Now that competes with their selfish motive and there's in their contests where the selfish motive wins. There's no question about that. But I just want to say that there is this other motive that has entered the game starting at about age three, which is that the right thing to do is to share it equally because he deserves it as much as I do. And um, I, I, I'll just repeat myself and stress it again. What the way, one of the things that I object to or that I don't like is when people say, uh, they always want to give it one motive. So if I have any kind of selfish motive at all or any kind of reputational motive at all, then that overrides any, any, any um, uh, pro-social motives I might have. No, they're in competition, I would say. I have both of them, okay? I'm, I'm selfish, uh, no question about that, but I also have a sense of fairness. And in some situations, it comes that one wins, and in some situations, the other wins. And um, uh, in the case where a sociopath, in the pure sense, probably doesn't have the same sense of fairness or, or pro-sociality, uh, but, might, but, might, but might still be governed by these external constraints of saying, well, if I'm mean to him, then he's going to be mean to me later or whatever. But I think the kids have a genuine sense, is my... Uh, understanding. Yeah. This is a different version of the same question, but uh, you said that five-year-old uh, who can communicate with each other linguistically, 80% uh, collaborate, 20% don't. Asking the 20% why they didn't, uh, they might be honest or dishonest <laughs> answers, but checking the response seems to be very important. And the second well, let me, let me just say very, quick, very quickly to that, this depends on the age of the child. So the three-year-olds, there were three-year-olds that were doing that. If you've ever done research with three-year-olds, you ask them, why did they do something? You get nonsense. They, they make up anything. They, they, they do not report on their motives accurately is all I can say. Five-year-olds is getting better, but still, what do you think? Five-year-olds, can they give you a good explanation? Five or six, maybe, okay. okay. Uh, last question. Um, um, the teachers of their clients teach the kids, uh, five-year-old kids, don't be free riding. And you use the word psychopath, but let's leave them out. Okay. They are a straight, nice kids, understand what the teachers and their taught, and they are still free riders. Why? Um, because I want the stuff, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I'll, I, I'm, you, you guys just collaborated and got something really great. <clears throat> I was too lazy to do it, but now I want it. I mean, the selfish motive sometimes wins. It wins in lots of cases. I don't, I don't, I'm, there's no question about it. Uh, what I'm saying is that when we, we set up this collaborative situation, it turns out, this, we had a hypothesis and it turned out to be true. You turn up, you have this collaborative, collaboration situation, it brings out fairness. And there are other situations which bring out selfishness. I think the dictator game brings out selfishness because it's an endowment effect. I already have it. I have to give up something I already have. Uh, I don't like doing that. Uh, so endowment, so the the dictator game brings out selfishness. Collaboration brings out more of a sense of fairness, um, uh, generosity. Uh, if I have more than I need, uh, I have uh, I can only eat a few of them, but I have a bunch of them. I'm probably more generous then. So there are various situations that bring out these different motives. But I think we all have all these motives, and there are individual differences uh, in all of these motives. So some, there, some are stronger in some, and some are in the other. And there are contextual factors that bring them out. Uh, and they, and they facilitate each of these motives um, in all of us. But, um, and, but I don't see any reason why, I think every situation, um, all those motives are at least potentially in play. So if I see a beggar on the street and I give him a dollar and there happens to be a cute girl nearby watching, I, and you say, oh, you only did it because the cute girl was watching and you wanted to impress her, I say, no, both. I felt compassion for the guy and I get a benefit, whatever, okay, win-win, okay, D double, double good. It doesn't mean the fact that I want to impress the girl means that I don't have any compassion for this guy. It's, it's both. And so we don't just reduce it to the selfish when the, uh, when, uh, automatically. They can both be present and the selfish wins a lot of times and a lot of the crazy stuff that happens in this world um, is in-group, out-group stuff. And so that's a whole different ball game. The, the, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have a, I don't feel the need to be fair and compassionate to the same degree without group members as I do with in-group members. So you've got a lot of the misery in the world and conflicts and lack of cooperation is stuff that the, the participants construe in an us versus them uh, fashion. Within the us, that's what I'm claiming. The, within the us, and that would be the small group uh, cooperation in early humans. Within the us, um, um, uh, cooperation is a powerful motive. It's not the only motive. Selfish motive is very strong as well, but it's a powerful motive.
Um, a fascinating talk. And um, I'm just wondering, so if you would use comparability to show the internationality uh, arise because of the interdependence among the members and states and their welfare, possibly due to proper uh, breeding. Uh, could you perhaps comment on joint intentionality in the other corporate breeding species, whether it's you know, the mere cats, the cichlid birds, or even monogamous? I just got a, a paper from a, a, a guy working at, at in, in Leipzig um, uh, with these uh, Arabian warblers, uh, and they're engaging in competitive altruism, uh, in in order to get into a, a collaborative thing. So, um, yes, I think with other cooperative breeders, uh, Sarah knows a lot more about it than I do. But um, in other cooperative breeders, I think you could have their version of it. I think the human version of it is special because. They're coming from other apes, and the other apes have already developed these theory of mindy things for competition. The chimps are doing things. We have our chimps understanding false belief. We have our studies of chimps engaging in all kinds of complex social cognitive things that evolve for special coordination, uh, I'm sorry, for special forms of competition, and humans come out of that. So we already have sophisticated mind reading abilities from competition as, as apes in general, and then we cooperativize the whole thing. One of the things, one of the terms I use in, in the latest book um, is that what happens uh, is that we cooperativize uh, the competition. So uh, fairness is a response to the, to the fact that we, we both really want it. We both really want it, and, the, and so we're going to cooperativize that, that, that conflict. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, so I think the other cooperative breeders, there's good evidence that they're more pro-social in various ways. Um, and the shared intentionality part of it, I think, has a cognitive component that I don't know for sure if it's uh, unique to humans, but I would say um, that since none of the other great apes are cooperative breeders, uh, that um, it's unique among great apes, at the very least, would be my take on it. That's, that's a very good question. So we've done a, a lot of research on dogs uh, uh, because dogs are the uh, other species who has adapted to human culture. <laughs> uh, and the dogs on this little test where you point where the food is, the dogs are, the dogs are very good at that. They don't follow the eyes only. No, they don't follow the eyes only. You, it has to be the head. It has to be the head. Uh, but but yeah but um, but the, um, um, but but uh, it, that was one of our original things was that the dogs did stuff that the chimps didn't do because they're adapted for the human thing. But a very interesting just to keep in mind always keep in mind about the dog research. Dogs are not doing this with other dogs. <laughs> they're doing it with humans. This is an adaptation for life in a human society. It's not uh, a naturally occurring uh, evolutionary um, uh, um, um, uh, occurrence in, in dogs among themselves. Okay, thank you.